Here we go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Martin. I'm the vice president of SD Media Pros. Welcome to our July meeting, how to write a feature film screenplay. Um, when we start off these meetings, uh, we like to have some time for everybody to mingle, to meet each other, grab some food and drink, um, learn about what each other does. Um, we're not going to go around the room and do a full introduction, but if this is your first meeting, or maybe your first meeting in a while, I am going to put you on the spot and ask you to raise your hand, introduce yourself to the crowd, and let us know who you are and what you do here in town. So do I have any brave souls that want to do that? I do see some faces. Yes, please, back there. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much. Over here. Thank you. Anyone else that wants to? Sir, in the vest. <laughs> we'll get you next, Rob. Very much. Excellent. Thank you. All right. No other takers. Um, that's fine. So take, take note of some of these faces and names. Try to connect with someone um, after the meeting or next time you see them. If you can help them out with their production, if you're interested in what they're up to, want to learn more, the whole point of these meetings is, is a chance for us to come together, to connect, to learn from each other, to share, and make those connections that will help take your next production, your next project to a whole another level. Um, another thing that we like to do here with these meetings um, is, of course, acknowledge our hosts. Uh, so I'd like to ask Jeffrey Brown to come up for, and take just a moment to let us know about this space that he is so graciously letting us use tonight. Thank you, Thank you all, and welcome San Diego Media Pros. Woo! Yeah. So this is Studio 710. It's a rental space, and we shoot all kinds of stuff. We just had Netflix in here for Comic-Con full of stars. Yeah, it was interesting. But... Um, it rents by the day, by the half a day, whatever, and I got a full set of gear and cameras and all kinds of lighting and whatever you might need. So if I can support anybody's production, feel free to let me know. And as a special thank you for coming into San Diego Media Pros, I left a 20% off discount hire over here that's good for the end of the year. So you can use it when you book online. So SDMP20. All right. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to let you get going. I know you got a lot of great Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you so much for that 20% discount. That's fantastic. All right, next, we're going to go to News You Can Use with Mark Mazenhoff. Uh, we like to put together some of the latest and greatest, and Mark will take you through that. Okay. Yes, uh, before I begin, none, well, first news item, those who haven't seen Fred Ashman, honestly, there's nobody, and this is not against anyone in town, just no one who knows more about production than this man. So if anyone wants to know anything about almost every aspect of production, he's been everywhere and just about everything, you can sit and chat with Mr. Ashman, you have an opportunity. He's just a wealth of information, so take opportunity that he's here, because he doesn't get here very often, all right? So news you can use. So you want to be a screenwriter. I thought uh, I'm going to make this sort of screenwriting central today on some news. So you're all here for screenwriting. What's it all about? How do you find information? Well, I just want to be a screenwriter. I need to be a screenwriter. I want to write stuff, right? Well, I, I ran across this great 
site. Get, get your cameras out. Scriptmag.com slash news. It's free to register for Scriptmag. So and they'll send you things over on your email if you'd like. Um, but it's a great spot. And the kinds of things on here are just wonderful for any level of writer going forward. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go back. For those who are using the old style phone, had to dig out your buttons. Okay. There you go. Free to register. Um, this is an example of the page. You've got the homes and how-tos, interviews, blogs, events. They've got all kinds of things you can get. Save on Final Draft 11. How to short do short film ideas here, right? Creating strong protagonists, plot kits, all kinds of stuff that is just great information and news. There's going to be some news in here that you come across here uh, on these things or blogs or writing on writing. Just wonderful information about writing. You can't go wrong on these kinds of things. Webinars, right? Your weekend box office. Just saw the Lion King today. Oh, wow. Just freaking, I don't know how they pulled that off. Technologically spectacular. Going forward, selling your screenplay, all kinds of things. So I can't encourage you enough to go to, go to this site here and, and look it up if you really want to be screenwriter, really want to write about writing, writing news. This is a great opportunity for that. So now that you want to be a screenwriter, where do you begin? You need to write on something. There's, there's pencil and paper. No one's going to say that's not a bad thing. Pen and paper, typewriter, all kinds of things you can do. Right on your computer seems to be the de facto. And I'm obviously, David is the expert at this. But there are a number of programs out there. Uh, there's one called Celtics. Uh, best for beginners is what it's rated at. Uh, there's a free version, but uh, best features are costing. Um, the final draft is kind of the industry standard. That's what seems to be most people use. And the reason being, it was first. That seems to be it. That's why it was out there first, kind of what it is. Great features. Uh, and then Movie Magic Screenwriter, best for writer's block, meaning that it has some ideas for you. It, it has functions that help you break out of ideas and, wow, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So it really helps you push forward. Uh, but those cost, okay? If you're going to do screenwriting, those cost. But there are three free ones down here, Fade In, Writer Duet, and Trebly that are free. I use Trebly because I don't, I don't write a lot in the film style, but it's a great little free program. And again, David, I'm sure, has a million more and has recommendations on what to use. But these are all great options for you. And the cool thing going forward about some of the, the, the ones that cost, not the free ones, but the ones that cost, is that many are collaborative in nature. So they're web-based, which was kind of cool as I'm looking through this. So you can work concept to completion. You can do a, a write it, break it down, do a storyboard, a schedule, and budget right there in the program. It's not just the program and send it off to somebody else. So if you're one-man band, these are great opportunities, right? You can leverage a tailored workflow, simple to learn. You can do one file, one file, kind of like uh, Google Drive, right? Google Docs, you work off one file. So collaborative, people can make some changes. And it's all one, not like version final, final seven, four, right? That's it. This is the, you, it's all one thing you're working for. And a lot of them are off in the cloud. So it's there with you all the time. You don't have to, did I bring it on my thumb drive? Do I have it on my computer? So great little ideas for that. And then you have a script. Now what? Well, you want to use it. You're going to use it for your writing, for your project. Or maybe you want to sell it, which is what a lot of people want to do. Sell that script. You want to get it out there. You want to make something with that script. But I caution you, okay? And this is caution. This was in the news in the Hollywood Reporter last year, and actually a little less than a year ago, about why so many wannabe screenwriters are getting scammed. So you've got to be careful. What's going on out there? Well, in general, pitch fests. They're a multi-million dollar industry, thrives in the dark corner of the mainstream entertainment business. Most people there are clueless about how to get their projects made. There are writing festivals, there's competitions, workshops, extension classes, websites, seminars, script analysts, and uh, writer's store in Burbank, not to mention rapacious producers and hungry managers all making money from punitive, or putative scribes, often oblivious to Hollywood reality. Each promises the chance to meet agents, producers, and executives. The reality of many, however, is that the executives are low-level, dispatched by higher-ups to field pitches that usually go nowhere. With no power to spend, these junior-level reps are typically paid a small sum along with perks such as, re such as uh, restaurant vouchers. I'm not saying all pitch fests are bad. And there are a number of them on this, on this story. If you go look at it, that we'll talk about them. But you've got to be careful. Some people do take advantage. 
There are freelance script analysts who charge anything from $45 to $2,000 for notes. There was a writer moonlighting as an analyst. He got fired by the company that hired him for being too blunt. We had a guy write a sequel to a 1996 movie called Set It Off. It was so god-awful, he literally misspelled the main character's name throughout the script, and he paid for seven pages of notes. He got fired because he did not, pardon me, blow him. The problem is that if you give too harsh notes, that person is not going to come back, and that's how their business model is, getting people to come back. So you have to be cautious on these things. There are programs out there. There are people out there. Uh, Dave's going to talk about him. One of the great guys right here, Robert McKee, his programs. People love this guy, right? I mean, you're going to talk about that. Maybe not. Okay. Dave's looking at me saying, okay, don't. Um, but the idea is to hook them there. So you've got to be careful. Do your research because as they find out, caveat emptor warns a fledgling rider. So that's, that's the news if you want to look at that. Just some good information. Take a picture again if you want to see that. It's great, in, great, great stuff to know as a writer. Understand that it's not easy out there, uh, but a good script will always find its way to be made as long as you do that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is news you can use. Oh, I can go back one stand. Take a quick picture, quick picture. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you. All right, and with that wonderful setup, I'm going to take us to our speaker here. Uh, brief bio here on David, just to kind of set the stage. David has been teaching screenwriting in San Diego for several years. He escaped from the foothills of Northern California, likewise. And since studying art at San Diego State University, has been performing in LA and San Diego on stage, screen, and as a voice actor. Some of his favorite stage roles include Elmore Chrome in Abundance and Bird Power in Send Me No Flowers. He also has a supporting role in an upcoming feature film called Overserved. When he's not acting, he directs. He played Claudius in his directorial debut, Never to Heaven, a dark thriller short film adapted from Hamlet, which screened at Shakespeare Shorts. Uh, he has been nominated for our film project, which was second runner-up. This is cutting in and out. Uh, best film, uh, second runner-up for best film in 2016. That's final winner, best film 2017, and one stand runner in 2019. Received a Best Screenplay Award. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, um, is the mic hot and I, you can all hear me? I'll take that as a yes. Silence just means yes to me. Um, so, I'm not going to do that just yet because it's a little early. I love when these things happen because we're switching back and forth between formats. Okay, that's me, I told you who I am. Um, I appreciate you coming. Um, and I know that Mark said I am the expert in this. Good God, no. Uh, there is no expert. There's no expert in screenwriting. There's no expert in filmmaking. There are people who have been doing it for a long time and are very successful. Um, <laughs> judge my success, if you will. Studied a lot uh, as well. I just every time I go to a movie, I'm always clocking the things that worked, that um, and and where they come into play as far as screenplay elements. And it's kind of astonishing how many films you watch will follow a very specific. I don't want to use the word template, but there is a, a model that most films still follow the three act structure, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I know you've all heard about the three act structure. A lot of people will bemoan the three act structure, and they're not wrong. Um, there's no one right way to make a screen or to write a screenplay. There's the main time-tested method that works, going all the way back to Aristotle, and then there are other ones that work as well. But if you pay attention to the ones that are not three-act structure, you'll find by and large they were generally written by the people who had the benefit of directing them. So unless you're going to direct your own screenplay, if you're going to pitch something, um, you should know this model. Um, okay, this is going to be a very abridged presentation, by the way. This usually takes like four hours. Um, so we're going to riff through this as fast as we can. I'll save questions at the end unless you get super lost, because um, I do have a tendency to talk fast, and I will try to remember to slow down. Maybe some say slow down. All right. Um, yes. Recommended screenplay books. I do recommend you read. Read screenplays, if nothing else. Um, but if you're going to read the screenplays, know what to look for. Um, Sid is the person who literally wrote the book on screenwriting. And it's still used today, but it's more of a primer. But it's a good book. You should still read it. David Trotter, 
Baker, I, har um, I recommend, because he goes into formatting your screenplay, which is kind of obsolete now because we have screenwriting software, but you don't need to have screenwriting software in order to properly format a screenplay. It's also just a really good quick start guide for writing a screenplay in general. Um, Robert McKee, as I said, goes much deeper into story and character development and dialogue. It's a really good in-depth book. Um, and if you have a chance to get the audio tape, I recommend it. He's very amusing to listen to. <clears throat> um, Linda Aaron, 21st Century Screenplay, she took a look at some of the other screenplays outside of the three-act structure and said, well, wait, what are some of the similarities between these? And she breaks out of the three-act structure into tandem narrative, multi-character narrative, converging plot lines, and so on. Those are not as common as the three-act structure. So they are out there, and again, they tend to be directed by the people who write them. And finally, John Truby's book, Story, uh, what is it, Story? Uh, sorry, Anatomy of Story. It's just a good overall primer on storytelling in general. Thank you, sir. Um, on storytelling in general, and it go, you know, whether it's novel writing or screenplay writing or whatever. So yes, read. Read books, read screenplays. How many of you have read a screenplay? Awesome! So few people have raised their hands when I asked that question. Um, who's who's like got a favorite screenplay that they've read? So I read Matt Bridges in Madison County. The screenplay. Then I it, yeah. Okay. Then I watched it while I read the screenplay, and it was interesting to see what they changed. Yeah, there's always going to be changes in 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 uh, shooting. And the minute the vast majority you're going to find on shooting scripts, and those are very different to what you're going to be writing. Um, okay. Uh, who knows about this book? Absolutely. All right. Recommend this book. <laughs> I really don't. It's not to say that it doesn't have merit. It does. But it is so rigid in its rules and templating that it actually blocks you in. Screenwriting is storytelling first and foremost. And if you follow this book as rigidly as it says it, as, as it tells you to, you're not going to have an organic, natural screenplay. Is it useful information? Of course. He's very successful. He's a successful screenwriter. He's, he he's made some, he did a few years ago, no. but it's not a book that I don't that I recommend. Um, let's see. We already took, okay, so spec script. The difference between a spec script and a production script or a shooting script. Um, it basically means No one's asked you to write this. You just of your love of screenwriting and your love of storytelling, you've decided, I want to share the story with the world, and I'm going to write this, and someday somebody will hopefully buy it. And yes, screenwriting.io is a very good website. Um, from people that the spec script is the heyday of this was in the 90s when Joe Esterhaus was the big deal, and he got like 2.5 million for one of his scripts. Um, that was a short-lived decade. <clears throat> for you know big screenwriting paydays, but spec scripts are still around, and they are still written by people who aren't necessarily you know Mind or Nolan. Liz, who wrote, the, uh, who wrote the Post, she was nominated for a screenplay award two years ago for the Post. That was a spec script M movie that just came out just now with um, oh Guardians of the Galaxy, big dude. His name is eluding me right now. It's Kumail Nanj Nanjiani and Drax. Thank you. Yes. Uber. That was a spec script. They're still buying spec scripts, and these spec scripts are still produced. You find a lot of these spec scripts on the blacklist. Um, I talked about um, film pitch festivals and how to be wary of them. The blacklist is one you should look into because a lot of those that are on there actually go on to get produced. Um, okay. Before I talk about what a screenplay is, I want to talk about what it's not because a lot of people have this misconception. Oh, I have a I have a novel, I can make it into a screenplay, or I have this whatever. Things are very different, and they're different for a reason. Um, a novel is told primarily through character's thoughts. <clears throat> my glasses, so I can see my notes. Pardon me. Um, thoughts and feelings often dictated or narrated by either a first person or a third person omniscient narrator. You're not going to have any of that in your screenplay. You don't have the space for it, and nobody wants to watch that, no matter how much they think they do. Nobody wants to watch a three-hour book on tape. No. Um, it's not a short story, although short stories, oh, wait, are we at short stories yet? No, it's not a poem. It seems obvious. Starting place, but you're not going to write a lot of fluid, florid poetry in your screenplay. A screenplay is very bare bones. essentials across. 
screenplay readers don't have a lot of time to get through your story. You want to give them the basics so that they can have a basic idea of what they're looking at so they can get on. You, well, we'll talk about that too. Um, <clears throat> it's not a painting, and the reason I say this is because a lot of people get in their mind and say, like, oh, I've got this great idea. There's going to be beautiful vistas, and she's going to be just this picture-perfect painting, and if it's not pertinent to the plot, nobody cares. Nobody cares. You've got great of something that doesn't produced it. Um, it is not a play. This is very important. Even though you can adapt something from a play, plays are very dialogue driven for a reason. They have constraints of the stage. There's a limited amount of action that they can convey in that stage in the amount of time that they're given. Um, it's something completely different from motion pictures. Motion pictures, as they say, it's a visual medium. You're trying to convey something visually, sometimes orally, uh, but don't get on Oh, my dialogue is going to be great. You still need to tell a story for the screen. Uh, it's not TV. Super important. It's not TV. There are some similarities between TV and movies, obviously, but TV, by its nature, is either episodic or very long-form, open-ended narrative. Um, you either are basing it on a set of characters that go through a series of adventures, or you have a very, very long arc that spans, what, sometimes 24 hours worth of TV. That's not the same thing as a movie. Screenplay. Um, screenplay is not a movie. It seems obvious, but this is an important distinction. You're not going to be putting things in your screenplay that you might see in a movie. You're not going to be putting actors' names or performances or screen directions or any of that kind of thing. Um, if you absolutely must put a screen direction in there because it moves your story forward, that's one thing, but by and large, you're not going to put any of that stuff in there. And finally, it is plot. Screenplay is not plot. Story is not plot. Plot is tell your story. Um, all right, so now that we've gotten all that, any questions on that? I know I'm talking very fast. All right, uh, let's get to what a screenplay is. Very simply, screenplay is what I've said, and you guys are the storytellers. Um, and going back to Sid Field, he's got the best description I can think of for a screenplay, which is a screenplay, bless you, uh, with pictures. What he means is that the reader should be picturing what they're seeing. Dialogue and description bolded those two words because those are the only two things you're going to be using in your screenplay, dialogue and description, um, and placed within the context of dramatic structure here. Um, all right, so talking about story. When you go to write your screenplay, to me the most important element in storytelling is to be truthful. Be truthful in your storytelling. And what does this mean? Um, it does not mean factual. It does not mean be factual. To paraphrase Indiana Jones, this is the quest for truth, not facts. If you want facts, you know, go take up science. Um, be true to your story, even more so than the events. You know, be true to your story. If you're basing it on a true story, uh, who saw Bohemian Rhapsody? Who has read or heard some of the controversy about when certain events took place in what order? Okay. Does anybody know why they did that in the film? For dr yeah, dramatic effect. For dramatic effect. You Telling someone's life story in the order that they lived it does not always make for a compelling narrative. Um, your story still needs to have a beginning, middle, and end. And swapping out the sequences doesn't detract from the story that they're telling. Um, you could argue whether or not they were being true to Freddie Mercury, but I think you could say that they were probably being true to the story they were trying to tell. Um, this is why I always say um, Oliver Stone's probably the best director for doing biographical movies because he doesn't care about facts, he just wants to tell a story. And you kind of know that when you're watching a film. Anybody who's seen The Doors knows that that's not re really happened. It's kind of a story. Um, okay. <clears throat> Be true to your character. Your story is about your characters. Your story is about what your characters do. Your story is about the decisions that your characters make. Um, more importantly, your story is, is about the decisions they make under pressure. Your characters must be making decisions time and time again. Your character can be reactive, and they can be proactive, but they have to be active. They uh -huh. cannot be passive. Passive characters are boring. Even Lebowski is not passive. He does stuff. He's either reacting to something, or he's moving this plot forward. At the end of the Big Lebowski, he's still the dude. Nothing's changed, but everything that transpired in that story, he did. Uh, OK. Um, this is just for me. Be wary of this defamation, character assassination. If that's your goal, Godspeed. But understand, if you're writing a story that's based on real characters, 
Be careful how you depict those people. These are real people with real lives, and people tend to believe what they see on the screen, whether they should or not. And finally, write what you know. Who knows this one? Write what you know. Who thinks it means this? <clears throat> write what you've done. No. What we did was write what we've done. There would, you know, there'd be no Star Wars. I've, no one has ever been a Jedi Knight with a lightsaber. Nobody works in Middle Earth. So no, what that means is write what you, <clears throat> excuse me, write what you understand, what you love, what you feel, what you As long as you write all of that, even if you put it in a context that no one's ever experienced before, um, the truth and the reality of what you know will still come through. You know, who, who's come from a podunk farm town, not farm town, but who, who's come from a podunk little town and wanted to get out and have some adventure? Oh. Just me? Star Wars, <laughs> you know? Just take that, that, that scenario and put it in space. Put anything in space. You know, take the Godfather, put it in space. It'll be awesome. <laughs> um, this is also really important as I'm concerned. Yes? Um, can you go back to the, not the backlight? This one? I'm not sure. Might take a minute. Oh. Okay, you're welcome. Sorry about that, folks. We're going to move on. And moving on. Okay. Respect the audience. The audience is always right. I'm shocked at how few people believe this. If you don't believe this, you don't know who your audience is. You don't get to determine for the audience whether what you've done is good, bad, or correct. The audience is always right. It's basic salesmanship. Who's heard the customer is always right? Who believes this? You've never been the customer then. <laughs> I, I'm actually really surprised. The audience is always right. People who go to see a Michael Bay movie know what they're getting into. Michael Bay knows his audience. He doesn't pretend that he's conveying anything other than what it is. He's, he's the master of Bayhem. He knows if you don't like it, you're not going to show up. He knows his audience. It depends um, on the audience, though, because test audiences are very, like, 85% of the time wrong. So they'll show a film to a test audience. Is a test audience wrong? Well, it's, I say it depends on the audience. That, no, is a test audience wrong? If, if you're pulling in the wrong demographic, then maybe, but that's still to the point, know your audience. Um, okay, the audience does not do anything. It is entirely coming upon you, the storyteller, to convey something to the audience. They're not required to respond in any way that you want them to. So make sure that you have that in the back of your head. This is a big one. Do not mistake the audience for being stupid. They're not. They really aren't. They've had a hard day at work. They go out to the movies. They don't want to watch Manchester by the Sea. They want to see robots <laughs> beating each other up. Maybe they've had a nice day. Maybe they do want to go see Manchester by the Sea. You know, know your audience. Um, and finally, I get this from William C. Martell. He calls us. I think this is a great term. And this is the audience becomes the person because more than anything you want your audience or your characters to be empathetic. They don't have to be sympathetic. They can be complete assholes, but if they are, you want to be able to say, yeah, I've been that asshole. Yeah, I totally understand. I've been that asshole. Um, okay, we're going to do a quick I'm going to, it's going to be a little lengthy. We're going to watch about five to seven minutes of Lethal Weapon 2, and I want you to pay attention to this clip. Everything that you're about to see is information. So let's see if I did this wrong. What's that? Well, we'll get there. <laughs> you go away and you go away. And no, wrong thing went away. <laughs> it's not like. We literally had this working before you came up. Yep. There we go. God, I love this job. Oh, man, can't you go any faster? Floor this. I, I, I can't. My wife's grabbing no con. I'm not going any faster. You're doing 65 now. 65? Oh, shit. Get your goddamn foot off the pedal. You're killing my goddamn corn. Yeah, yeah, we're eastbound on fourth. We're in the tunnel. We're in pursuit of red BMW driver, Caucasian blonde hair. Plate number two for Adam Henry, 174. Use caution. You are westbound, 2nd Street, 2112, south on Figueroa, approaching 2nd. You're heading straight towards each other. Somebody back off. Okay, Roger, I got you. What'd she say? What'd she say? What'd she say? She said we're about to have an accident. <laughs> You're gonna get us killed! Shit, I'm the one who went down! You got 
red, we're going with the blue one. What's the pursuit, sir? We got a dual pursuit, 20 William 15 and 20 William 12. Who's that? It's Murtaugh and his squad. 20 bucks on Riggs and Murtaugh. Who's driving? Murtaugh and his wife's station wagon. I'll take it. Wait, I don't know me nothing too. about the wife's station wagon. Back to all. Hey, shut up! Shut up. What the hell is that? What the fucking language is that, huh? I've never heard of that shit before. I think it was German. Uh, German, no. Is it Japanese? It's Japanese radio. Maybe they bought the LAPD as well. And they own everything else. Thanks for the scoop. Yeah. Arm, the son of a bitch just shot up my wife, Winfield. They're in the pursuit. Westbound on third. Hill.
Well, it still is. On three. One. Two. Three! Go, man. Kruger, Hans. Kruger, Hans. Kruger, Hans. You can't import this into the country. I believe you're right, Roger. All right. Why did I show you that? Absolutely. Why did I choose this particular? Such as? Uh, there's so much character exposition in there. And in what way? You know that Riggs is married and his, he's... Murtaugh's married. Um, you know that Riggs is crazy. You know that... Um, How do we know Riggs is crazy? <laughs> because he throws... Yeah, he ran after, he's running, he's running after the bad guys when everybody else is driving. All right, what else do we learn from that clip? A lot. There's a lot going on in there. There's a very specific reason I chose this clip. Okay. The dynamic between the relationship. What about it? Uh, he's the risk taker. Murtaugh's like trying to hold him to be safer. Okay. What's their comfort level with each other? Very much. Very much. Okay. Um, what else? Anything else? What did we learn about the other characters? We learned that the bad guys were foreign. Were foreign. Do we know quite yet what language they were speaking? Okay. There's a clue in the money that they found, right? From South Africa, okay. For people who hasn't seen Lethal Weapon 2, first of all. You haven't, okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put you on the spot. You've seen Lethal Weapon 1 though, right? Yes. Okay, if, okay so based on, what, based on the Krugerrands and what they saw at the end, what would you say this story's gonna be about? Right, okay, not, not too far off, that's about it. There's going to be a moral dilemma about There should always be a moral dilemma, first of all. Yes, there's going to be a moral dilemma, but there should always be a moral dilemma for your characters. All right, I'm going to cut through a lot of this. The reason I chose this is, number one, it's a sequel. It's a sequel to a movie with characters. You still need to with the original. And movies tend to do this very well. Um, even the Marvel movies, um, if you watch some of like Avengers, they'll do in the characters. So we're reintroducing characters into this world. Number two, yes, it's good delivering a lot of exposition with not a whole lot of words. And virtually the entire squad is after these people. They're heavily armed. They've got a helicopter. This is not some fly-by-night operation. We don't quite know why they're in, per in this particular situation in the first place. Um, but let's see, what else do I have in there? Oh, the tone. What tone does it set? What is it? What kind of movie is this? Action, what else? Drama. What else? Comedy. 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 There's, there's, there's deliberate comedy in there. Um, let's see, we've got the wife's car. Uh, okay, and I wanted to do, who's heard of in medias res? Who knows that term? You might run into this occasionally. This is a term that basically means, what's that? What's the term? In medias res, and I should have written it down. Uh, in, the middle of the, in the middle of the scene or in the middle of the action. This quite literally drops you right in the middle of the action. You can't get more in the middle of the action than this. Um, so that's why I chose this particular movie. It's also, this is the beginning of the movie, and the beginning of the movie is what's generally referred to as a hook. Who wants to see what happens next? Based on this clip. Right. Um, 
So yeah, even if you're doing a sequel to an established franchise, even if you're <clears throat> reintroducing characters, even if you're trying to set up the most basic plot line, you can do it all in the first five minutes of your movie, even with all these limitations. Um, so, and that's because you have a structure. Why is structure important? Um, first of all, let's talk about what structure is. It's just the manner in which you arrange elements of a story. And as I said, we're gonna talk about three-act structure tonight. There are other ways to arrange your elements. It's important because without structure, you get chaos. And it doesn't matter what you're in, all of these follow a specific structure. If you're talking about paintings, Jackson Pollock went in a completely different direction from everybody else, but every Jackson Pollock follows a Jackson Pollock structure. Okay, every um, Jackson poem follows an Emily Dickinson structure. So you, so this structure is important. You can't just throw words on a page and expect to have a story. Uh, even movies like Memento, Dunkirk, Pulp Fiction, these are movies that famously broke the three-act structure. Um, but if you look at Dunkirk, Dunkirk is three stories told simultaneously. Not a coincidence that it's told in threes. If you look at Memento, Memento actually does follow a three-act structure. It's just told in reverse. Um, and it's your basic murder mystery. It's like any Ma Agatha Christie murder mystery. You start with the murder, and then you try to find out who done it. And Pulp Fiction has a very specific structure. It's told in vignettes, but it has a structure that converges at the end. They're not just haphazardly put together. Uh, OK, so let's just get to the meat of it. Um, so yeah, as I said, three is very much alive and it works. I know Werner Herzog has railed against this, saying it's brainless to structure yourself in. And to a point, he's correct. I don't think of these as rules. They're guidelines. They're especially guidelines for when you get stuck. You do not have to, you do not have to save the cat on page 10. You do not have, to have your catalyst on page 12. You do not have to have your first act turning point on page 13. Bull. That's absolute bull. They should be around those times, those around those areas, but they don't occur right on the page. If you're that, then you're trying to force something that doesn't need to be forced. Um, Jean-Luc Godard, you know, you're not going to look at a Jean-Luc Godard movie and say, oh, this has a very, def you know, definitive three-act structure, but even he will tell you a movie has a beginning, middle, and end, or a story has a beginning, middle, and end, but not necessarily in that order. Uh, okay. Why? Why are you doing this to me? Not what I want you to do. Okay. Um, a screenplay is roughly 120 pages because 120 pages is about a two hour movie because one page equals approximately a minute of screen time if you are writing it correctly. And this breaks down into, you'll notice act two is bigger. This is where I get my cameo. Oh, is this breaking, is this not it's working? It's making. Oh my, folks. So just outside. Right. We'll just turn it's probably because I keep moving my head around too. All right, is that better? Is that, be is that a little too loud? All right, we'll try not to talk down. Um, anybody miss anything that I need to recap? Good. Um, the first 25% of your screenplay is going to be your first act. It doesn't matter how long it is. In a 180 page screenplay, the first 45 pages or first 45 minutes are gonna be your first act, your second act is gonna be 90 pages, your third act is gonna be 45. Typically in a two hour screenplay, it's 30, 60, 30. And if you, and I do this a lot. Go to the movies and clock it and see what happens. See what happens when the first act happens. It, it happens around the first 25% of the movie. This is true for The Godfather. At 45 pages in, almost to the page, um, Don Corleone gets shot, starting off the gang war. About 90 pages after that, he ends the gang war. That's when Sonny gets killed and the gang war is over. There's going to be spoilers. Sorry, folks. Watch movies, read screen, screenplays. I, I told you right there in the ad, there's going to be spoilers, so be prepared for those. Um, okay, uh, what do we got here? Oh, and Act Two, the reason it's so long is because it is essentially the story. And we'll talk about that shortly. Um, so here we go. Act One, beginning, middle, and end. Pretty basic, but what is the beginning? It's the setup. Introduce your characters, introduce your world, introduce their normalcy. Your characters at the beginning are in a stasis that as far as we the audience is, are concerned, it's always been that way for them. Luke Skywalker has always been on Tatooine wanting to break out of things, you know? That's just the way it's always been. Um, so we're gonna introduce that world and then we're gonna throw some conflict at them that, they, that they've got a breakthrough and that they have to resolve. Do they win? Do they lose? Do they fall in love? Do they go their separate ways? And this is achieved by introducing your character, 
giving them a goal, and I put goal in Acts 3 because, you know, they're either going to achieve the goal or they're not. And the obstacle, what or who is in the way? With these things in mind, you already have a solid foundation for writing a screenplay. Focus on the obstacle, focus on the goal, focus on what the character wants, and you have a pretty good idea of where to go. The best quick example of a three-act structure, believe it or not, comes from speed. Because Act 1 is the elevator, Act 2 is the bus, and Act 3 is the subway. It's that simple. What's speed about? A bomb on a bus. Act 2 takes place entirely on the bus. We don't get to the bus until Act 2. The whole movie is not about the bus. Act 1, we're setting up the characters, what they do, who's the risk taker. Um, you know, Keanu Reeves is obviously the forefront of this team. Jeff Daniels is the support person. Um, then we get on the bus, we meet new characters, we marshal some forces, we'll get to this later. And then we get off the bus, and now we're on the, and now we're on the subway. Okay, log lines. I know, you guys really want to get to the meat of this. These sort of things are important because the distillation of your idea into one or two sentences will help you greatly in staying on track if you get lost, because it will remind you what your story's about when you start to go off the rails and go off in tangents or wonder what your character should do next. And the logline should have a character, an obstacle, and a goal. This is not a marketing logline. This is not a marketing logline. This, mar this is a logline for you. Marketing loglines include things like Jaws in Space for Alien. That's a marketing logline, and it's great. Um, but this is just to keep you focused on your story. Um, so let's look, at a, let's look at a few. Who knows what movie this is? Falsely convicted of murdering his wife, a once prominent surgeon escapes to find the real killer and clear his name. Fugitive. Okay, what do we have here? We have character, obstacle, goal. Let's try another one. Mute woman develops a love affair with a sea creature, hatches a plan to rescue him from his sadistic captors. Who knows what this one is? Shape of water. Who's our character? Mute woman. What's her goal? Rescue him. What's the obstacle? See? You guys don't need me anymore. You guys are already writing screenplays. We'll do one more. Um, when the woman he loves is kidnapped by supernatural pirates, a young blacksmith joins forces with an eccentric ship captain to rescue her. Pirates of the Caribbean. Who's the main character in Pirates of the Caribbean? Captain Jack Sparrow. No. <laughs> but I can see why you think that. He took over the story. He's the most boisterous, most flamboyant character. He's the one that draws the attention. But is he the one with the goal? No. no. He's Han Solo. Jack Sparrow is Han Solo. He's the one who's enlisting um, Will, oh God, what's his name? Turner. Orlando Bloom. Will Turner, thank you. He's enlisting Will Turner's, um, or Will Turner's enlisting Jack Sparrow's help to rescue the princess, essentially. It's the old Star Wars, par Star Wars paradigm all over again. Um, so there you go. All right. Um, now we're going to get into the template portion. I'm going to throw a lot of terms at you. These are terms that you should be aware of. You don't have to use every single one. It doesn't have to occur on an exact page, um, but they should occur more or less in this order, and if they don't, know why you're not doing it that way. So let's start with the hook. We already talked about this with Lethal Weapon 2. Um, this is basically, you know, your James Bond movies. We're going to open on James Bond having an adventure. Raiders of the Lost Ark is the same way. Or if you're doing a drama, like The Godfather, we're going to open on a tight close-up of Bonacera talking about why he loves America and why that love of America is souring. You know, these are all things to hook your audience in and draw them into the rest of the story. It doesn't have to be drawn. Who saw Moonlight? Moonlight does this very well. We're introduced to this really interesting world of drug dealers, but they're not your typical drug dealers. You know, they've got this drug dealer that kind of actually cares about his drug mules and We've got him, um, we've got the little boy who is running away from these other kids who are calling him homophobic slurs. And these are all things that hook you in and let you know what kind of story you're about to watch. So even in a drama, make sure you have some sort of hook if you can. Catalyst, oh, introduce your, your characters, of course. This is where you're going to introduce your main characters. This is not the hardest rule in the book, but it is a pretty hard rule. Luke Skywalker shows up in the first act. Will Turner shows up in the first act. Norman Bates shows up in the second act. But make no mistake, Psycho is Norman Bates' movie. If you look at that whole second act, it's Norman Bates. 
But we need that whole prologue, and it's a misdirect, and Hitchcock did this on purpose. But even though he was misdirecting the audience, he knew whose story he was telling. You know, he kills off Marion Crane right at the act two turning point, and now we're into, now we're into Anthony's story, or Norman Bates' story. Um, okay. Catalyst, inciting incident, Linda Aronson will call this the disturbance, uh, something that interrupts the life of your character so that they go and do something else. Thelma and Louise are gonna go for the weekend to a cabin, but then they're sidelined by, you know, Thelma wanted to sort of party, and Thelma always gets raped. That's an inciting incident. A lot of people will tell you, and we'll go, okay, let's just move on. I'll get back to that, to Thelma and Louise. Um, subplot, subplot, Relationship plot, relationship line, B story, these are all kind of the same thing. The subplot usually is a relationship between the two characters in an action movie. Um, if it's a drama, even in a drama, you know, like say Manchester by the Sea, uh, Casey Affleck's goal is to find somebody else to take care of his nephew because he can't do it. But along the way, he still has this relationship that he has to mend with his ex-wife. So you're always gonna have those two relationships. It'll make your story richer. Um, Will Turner's going to rescue um, Elizabeth, but then he develops this relationship with Jack Sparrow. So you're always going to have that B plot. Um, the theme develops. Back to Thelma and Louise again. You know, this is a world in which women are subordinated by men and abused by men and can't get a fair shake by men. This is a, this is a theme that's going to develop throughout the course of the story. But it should be introduced at the beginning of the movie. Um, what is your character's worldview? How do they see the world? Is it fair to them? Is it not fair? Um, is it too political? Is it not political enough? Is it beautiful? Yeah. Is it maybe 50-50? Absolutely. And then doubt, rejection. This is your character not wanting to go on the adventure, not wanting to do the story. This is the classic hero's journey. This is what Lucas followed for Star Wars. You know, initially Luke's like, oh, I can't go. I got to stay home. I got to take care of my aunt and uncle. And then they get crispy fried and he goes and has an adventure. Um, this is the same thing that happens in The Hobbit. He just says flat out, I'm not going on an adventure. That's, that's his first thing. He's not prepared for this. He's happy in the Shire. But guess what? No story, no adventure, so he's going to go on an adventure. Plot point one. This is the thing that starts your story in motion. Um, again, Linda Aronson will call it the first act turning point. There's going to be a number of reasons for it. But at some point, your act two has to start, which means your story has to start. Um, and, Thelma and, Louise, and sometimes it's stated outright. Thelma and Louise. Louise says outright, I'm going to Mexico. It's going to take me about two, uh, two days to get there if I haul ass. Uh, but I need to know if you're along for, for the ride. It tells us everything we need to know about what's going to happen over the next hour. Um, and there's a time limit. I'm going to take me two days to get to Mexico. Time limits are super, um, super useful in your movies. Uh, let's see. Who saw Michael Clayton? No, wait, not Michael Clayton. No, we'll get back to it. Uh, okay, questions so far. I know I'm going very fast but I kind of want to breeze through this because this is just sort of like mechanical. Um, okay, goal statement is, act, is sometimes said here. This is Thelma, Lu Thelma Louise saying what they're going to do. Luke Skywalker, I want to go with you to Alderaan. I want to become a Jedi like my father. This is what we're going to do. Um, or even something as oblique, like Michael Corleone is saying, you know, maybe I need to kill McCluskey and Soloxo. This is something that he's not had to do before, but that tells us something about what his character is going to go through. Marshalling forces, um, forming alliances. This isn't an absolute, but this often happens in these kinds of stories. It usually does. Something like The Incredibles, Mr. Incredible in the first act of Act Two. He's working out. He's going out on adventures with, you know, with that syndrome s sending him out on. He's met new people. This is where you're building up um, relationships. Lord of the Rings, you know. This is where all of the fellowship starts to meet one another, is in the first half of Act Two, as they go on their adventures. Um, exploring new worlds, you know. Luke Skywalker's going to take off a Tatooine and he's going to go to Alderaan, or so he thinks. Um, okay. Or a new world can be one that has changed. Again, in Manchester by the Sea, Casey Affleck is coming back to a world that is different than the one he left. And it's different because he changed it. Who's seen Manchester by the Sea? Okay. Essentially, he got drunk, went out for beer, left the fire going. Spoilers. Um, his kids burned to death because the house burnt down. And now he is both traumatized himself, his wife doesn't like him, and the community has exiled him. And now he's back because his brother has died and he has to you know, uh, support or adopt his nephew. So he's coming back to a world that is not the same as the one that he was raised in. So that's still a new world. 
um, rising conflict. You want to put your characters through the ringer until they get to the midpoint. This is often called the point of no return. This is where your characters can't go back to the way things were. Um, again, the best example is probably Star Wars. They're captured by the Death Star. They got no options now. They're committed to a certain path and they have to follow it through. And the Godfather, Michael kills Selezzo and McCleskey. This is it, he can't take that back. You can't take back a murder. He's part of the family now. He's, mur he's a murdering part of the Corleone family. Uh, again, midpoint, rising crisis, you wanna keep putting, put your characters through hell. Put your characters through absolute hell. The more you love your characters, the more hell you should put them through. The greater the stakes, the greater the catharsis for the audience, because we wanna know how the F are they gonna get out of this? How would I get out of this? Do you know how, you know, it gets their, it gets their brains moving and it, and it sets off their empathy. It's like, oh my God, how much more crap can this character go through? Uh, let's see. Converging plot lines. Um, let's say, who saw Heat? Heat is two different stories told at the same time. We've got Robert De Niro, who's got, who's doing the bank robberies. Um, and we've got Al Pacino, who's the cop. These are two separate plot lines that eventually have to converge. Um, they, these happen to converge uh, in the middle where the two characters have coffee. If it's something like um, the girl with the dragon tattoo, Mikhail Blomquist and Elizabeth Solander are on two separate strands of the same story until they converge. Um, so this is something that happens until, well, or even Han Solo and Boba Fett at, at Empire Strikes Back. He's being chased this whole movie and at the end they're gonna come to a head. All right, um, apparent defeat. Who saw Black Panther? Say, see some movies, guys. <laughs> see as many movies as you can. Great for a frame of, frame of reference. At the um, end of the third act of Black Panther, for all intents and purposes, the hero is dead. We think the hero is dead. All is lost in Wakanda. Everything is bleak and there's no hope. Give your audience, if you can, that no hope moment. There's no coming back. Um, and then plot point two, rally the climax. These are all just technical terms. This is essentially the close of your story. The meat and potatoes of your story is done and now we're gonna figure out what's the outcome of this? What was all this leading to? And again, the Godfather, Sonny gets killed, Vito Corleone wakes up from his coma and he's like, all right, we're gonna end this war now and we're gonna find out what the outcome of that, of ending that war or how he's gonna end that war. Often this also involves a new plan of action. Your character's plan didn't work, so now they're gonna try something new. You know, Kirk McCoy and Kirk's wife uh, Kirk's ex-wife and son are stranded in the middle of a rock in space because Khan put him there. How are they going to get out of that? What's the new plan? New plan. And confrontation. This is it. This is the, you know, this is the big battle at the end. Who wins? Who loses? Resolution. Do we go home? Have we changed? Are we the same? You know, if you're Charlize Theron and young adult, you're back at the beginning. If you're the dude, you're back, you're back at the beginning. If you're the hobbits from Lord of the Rings, you're completely different. Those hobbits, who saw the Lord of the Rings? Okay, do the hobbits return to the same world they left when they go back to the Shire? No, it's totally different for them. The world itself has changed, but from their point of view, it's not the same at all. They're, they're changed, therefore that world has changed because they've been exposed to something new. Uh, all right. There we go. What? Oh, sorry. Um, Denouement, this is just basically, you know, the end of the movie. The soft landing. Yeah, what's that? The soft landing. The soft landing. That, you know, that's a really good way of putting it. All the, you know, this is where all the plot lines are, are, all the plot strands are resolved. If you have any dangling relationship strands, these are resolved. Yes? Like the catalyst and inciting incident, there are like three in the first act of Thumb and Louise. You, you only need one, you know. Um, and like, which one are you thinking? Well, and again, in like in Psycho, yeah, in the first 30 minutes, we don't meet the main character. We meet him right at the start of act two. So it's kind of a cheat because he's still sort of in act one. By the way, these turning points, they're not like instantaneous on the page. They might go on for like five pages, you know, depending on it, because it might be it might be an action sequence of some kind, or it might be something that these characters are having to go through. Um, okay. And Coda, kind of some kind, of an epilogue. Marvel movies are doing this a lot as stingers. Those aren't really Codas so much as they're advertisements for the next movie. 
Uh, but this is sometimes a punctuation in the film. Raiders of the Lost Ark, the code of the Raiders is we see the warehouse where the Lost Ark is going to get really, really lost. In Terminator, the first ones where Sarah Connor's driving off you know, into a storm, we don't know what's going to happen to her. Um, Carrie, who saw the original Carrie, go to that, a hand right out of the grave. Scare the crap out of your audience one more time. Rosebud, we finally find out what Rosebud is at the end of Citizen Kane. It's the coda. Um, oh, my favorite one, Back to the Future, my favorite one of all time. Where we're going, we don't need roads. You were right on top of it, weren't you? For that reason? Awesome. Yeah, where we're going, we don't, re we, we don't need roads. And no, that wasn't a setup to a sequel. As Zemeckis has said, if he thought he was going to make a sequel, he would have never put the character of Jennifer in the car. Um, but yeah, these are just sort of fun little ends to your story. Want versus need. Give your character something they want. If your character doesn't want anything, wh why are we watching them? And what is the difference between that and what they need? Um, first of all, what does your character need? Let's find that out. Their need usually fuels their desire. Um, and we'll get to a few examples of this. And it's best if what they want is in direct conflict with what they need. So let's take a look at this. I'll give you some examples. Scrooge. What does Scrooge want more than anything? Leave me alone. Ah, Christmas. Ah. What do we know is going to happen to Scrooge? We don't need to have seen a Christmas Carol to know what's going to happen to Scrooge at the end of a Christmas Carol, do we? Because what does Scrooge need more than anything? He needs love, and he needs to value the spirit of Christmas. Uh, okay. Um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Who's seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? This one really gets me. More people have seen this than any other example I asked for. It's really weird. <laughs> Ferris Bueller's Day Off is not about Ferris Bueller. It's about Cameron Fry. Cameron is the one whose character goes through the arc. He's reactive because Ferris Bueller is the more proactive character. It's sort of a parallel storyline. But, but Cameron Fry goes through the arc, and what he wants he wants to keep from getting in trouble this entire day. Oh my God, I don't want my dad to find out. I don't want my dad to find out. And at the very end, he realizes, no, I need to face this. I need to face this demon. And he trashes his dad's car, as we all do. <laughs> uh, Worldview, I don't want to belabor this too much. Give your characters an, an idea of how they see the world. You know, if they're, if they're a vegetarian, that's going to inform how they see the world. If they're religious or if they believe in God, these are not the same thing. Belief in God is more spiritual. Religion is more dogmatic. Um, give them something that describes their, their worldview. And we're going to go through a few of these as well. I love this. I talked about this earlier. Put the worst, most unforgivable parts of yourself into your characters. This is scary for us as writers because we don't want to be called out for the pieces of shit that we are. We're people. All of us as people have horrible parts to us. All of us. Put those in your characters on screen. Um, so let's take a look at... Years ago, my mother used to say to me, she'd say, in this world, Elwood, you must be oh so smart or oh so pleasant. For years I was smart, I recommend pleasant. Tells us everything about how Elwood sees the world, doesn't it? That's all we need. But how Elwood reacts in the rest of the film should flow from that. <laughs> this is another one back to Star Wars. If there's a bright center of the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. That's how, that's how Luke sees his world right now. He wants action, he wants adventure, and he wants to get out of here now. I'm going to go through these two because these tell you something about these characters and what they're about to go through that you can glean just from this. Not just how they see the world, but what's going to happen within the film. Um, okay. Crime rate, uh, crime rate in New York will kill you. There are so many problems. You never feel like you're accomplishing anything. But in, one man, in Amity, one man can make a difference. This tells us three very important things. One, he's from New York. He thinks crime is out of control. And he wants to make a difference. These are very important things. This one's even more interesting. The crime you see now, kind of the same thing as Martin Brody. It's hard to even take its measure. It's not that I'm afraid of it. I always knew you had to be willing to die to even do this job, but I don't want to push my chips forward and go out and meet something I don't understand. What, are we, what three things do we know from this quote? Anybody want to hazard a guess? You don't have to. Okay, number one, he thinks crime is out of control. He's number fearless. two, what's that? Fearless. He's not afraid to die. Number three, story-wise, He's about to go out and meet something he doesn't understand. That's going to happen. If that's not going to happen, there's no reason for him to say that. So that's our little bit of foreshadowing. Um, God, am I actually ahead of time? It's going to, yeah. All right. What's that? Plenty of time, baby. That's really unfortunate. Uh, 
All right, we're going to do a little backtrack because I thought this was going to take longer. So we're going to start with formatting and I'm going to back up to a little bit more of screenwriting in general. So thank you for your patience. This is what a screenplay looks like on paper. This is how you're going to visualize it. A little bit of text for description, a little bit of text for the characters and their, and their dialogue. Mark's already gone through most of this, uh, the software that you can buy. Software is good. It saves you time, it saves you effort in having to format, uh, but you really don't need it. You can use Word to format your screenplay just as easily as anything else, but it will not write your story for you. Absolutely not. No matter what you've heard about some screenwriting software like Dramatica, where they'll literally say, here, plug in this plot point in here, plug in this plot point in here, plug in, it's not going to happen. You need to write your story because otherwise it's going to look like an AI wrote it. And if any of you have seen that AI screenplay that was made into a movie, holy cow, please watch it. It's brilliant. <laughs> brilliant in all the wrong ways. Um, okay. Oh, and yes, I highly recommend Celtics because it's free. Uh, okay. See description. Keep it short, keep it visual, and keep it oral, meaning audio. Um, headings, where and when, interior, bedroom, day, that's it, very basic. Have a narrative description, a very brief description of what's going to happen. Steve walks in the room. Steve walks in the room. Not Steve is walking into the room. Steve will walk into the room. We see Steve walk into the room. Steve walks into the room. We don't see anything. Sir? Shouldn't Steve be capped because it's the first time we see him? No. You can. It's not going to be a big deal. But those were mostly for, those are mostly for shooting scripts and screenplays where the cinematography or, or cinematographer or the AD or the sound department or the prop department or whatever was going to have to go through and break down the script and notate what the things that they were going to need for the shot. If you're just telling the story, you don't need to all caps it. That, that's kind of fallen out of, that's kind of fallen out of popularity. Yeah, and it's not wrong. You can certainly do it. You know, the first time you introduce a character, having it, all, having it in all caps is not wrong. That's certainly fine, but you don't really need it. Uh, okay, um, dialogue. You know, who is saying what? It's that simple. Um, the scene headings are also called slug lines, interior coffee shop day, exterior football stadium night, very basic. Um, again, these are all variations of what you can do. Generally, you're just going to say day night. Depending on the absolute needs of the screenplay, it can be more specific. If you're going from outside the coffee shop to inside the coffee shop and you have to switch, you can just say later. Uh, or you can just say same or continuous. If you don't have a specific time, just say later. Generally speaking, it's just going to be day or night. Um, narrative description. Keep it short. Keep it short. Give us the character, who. Give us what they're doing and where they are. And yes, you will put some sounds in here, but you're not going to have to capitalize. And you can if you want. But the sound department's going to go through and do it themselves anyway, according to the director's needs. So why bother? Um, Certain ways that you can spice up your screenplay, because um, for number one rule is if the audience can't see it and if the audience can't hear it, it doesn't belong on the page. Internal thoughts of your character in a descriptive, um, in a descriptive block are useless because we're not going to hear them. Um, there's even a line from the script of Thelma and Louise, you know, uh, Thelma pulls out a gun from the drawer. It's a gun that Daryl bought her last Christmas to, for her protection. We don't know that. How do we know that as the audience? It never comes up again in the screenplay. Those things just excise them. Um, for character description, oh, I like this. Elizabeth Salander, who, who for the girl with the dragon tattoo, this is a great description. I love it. A walking work in progress, a punk rock elf with a switchblade attitude. Can you visualize that person? So yes, you can still be creative in your storytelling or in your, um, in your descriptions. Uh, I know Sid Field talks a lot about the first line of the script for Body Heat, which was Flames in a Night Sky, which is both great visually and thematically, because it tells you not only what's going on, you know, fire in the distance, but it also tells you a little bit about what the story is going to be about. It's called Body Heat, after all. Um, OK, spoken dialogue. And one, you want your character name. It's going to be more or less in the center, um, but you're not going to center it. You can follow the formatting rules of any of those screenwriting softwares going to give them their spoken dialogue, and you're not going to do this unless you absolutely have to. This is directing on page. This is you trying to tell your actors how they should be delivering a line. And from what I understand, most actors will get the script and just cross all of those out anyway. So you've just wasted space on your screenplay. 
Um, machine building. Get in late, get out early. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Steve drives into the garage, gets out, walks into the house. He comes in through the kitchen, across the living room to the bedroom. He drops his briefcase on the bed, loosens his tie. Katie comes in from the bathroom and says, you're home early. How much of that do we need? How about just Steve comes in the bedroom? We, don't, we, don't need, we, we know he's home. We don't need to see him driving in. We don't need to see where he came from. We don't need to know that he came from work. Just show us the briefcase. Just show us, the, just show us Katie. Show us the bedroom. Show us the basics. Um, try and shift emotions from positive to negative or vice versa. You know, if Steve comes in and he's a little tired and Katie's coming in and she's all decked out. She's in a good mood. Um, maybe he'll say, you look nice, and she'll say, thank you. It certainly took time getting ready. And he'll say, ready for what? She'll say, for the party tonight. Oh, what party? Oh, is it our anniversary? Suddenly, all this happy banter turns to a conflict, and, may, and the scene should end on that conflict. Um, da -da 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 -da. And every conflict within a scene should have a beginning and an end. Beginning, middle, and end. Just like the entire story. Beginning, middle, and end starts with the, starts with the story, then goes down to the act, then goes down to the scene, and so on. All right, um, got that. All right, dialogue. You're welcome. Dialogue. Dialogue in a scene is not real speech. You've heard me talking. Uh, um, uh, thinking by a thought. Durr. That's real speech. It's filled with likes and you knows and ums and breaks and breaks in our thought process. And if you like that kind of thing, I, I encourage you to watch Happy Christmas. You'll go mad. You'll go mad within the first 30 minutes because that's what they do because they want it to be a real speech and you want to shoot yourself. No, we want to we wanna just hear these characters talking. If that's specific to a specific character, that's one thing. That's a very specific choice you're making for a very specific character. But if you're doing that for everybody, then it's just distracting. Um, what does dialogue do? Number one, it reveals character. How the characters speak, how they present themselves, says who they are. Maybe they don't speak at all. Day of the Jackal, we never hear the Jackal speak at all, I don't think. If he does, he speaks very, very conservatively. Um, if you're, you know, if it's Glengarry Glen Ross, those people can't shut up, like me. Um, tells you a little bit of something about the character. Uh, propels the story. We're going to get to exposition in a minute, but the dialogue should propel the story, either the action or the relationship, or both, you know, ideally both at the same time. Um, it establishes tone. Just like we saw in Lethal Weapon, dialogue's going to establish tone just like anything else. Is it happy banter? Are these people deadly serious? Um, are they sort of um, oblique in the way they present themselves? It's going to establish tone. And of course, it presents exposition. So what is exposition? Who knows exposition? Dialogue that explains the plot. Say that again? Back it up one? See, I do go too fast. This is why I'm ahead of time. All right. My favorite example of exposition is in Austin Powers. Basil Exposition is my favorite character ever. Because why does he exist? Basil Exposition shows up literally to do nothing but say what the plot's going to do next, and then he disappears. It's a brilliant use of that character. Um, you can be creative about it. In Inception, it's done literally on the run. Like halfway through the movie, they're in the dream. They're, they're doing their caper. They're right in the middle of their dream. And something went haywire. And they're being converged upon by all these dream minions. And as this is happening, there's all this brand new, completely brand new exposition about what could happen if they don't complete their mission. So suddenly they're in a dream state. They, are, they need to go to a secondary dream state because one of them's been shot. And we know that if you're, you know, if you're shot, or you die, you usually wake up. But no, they're so heavily drugged that they're going to go into limbo. It's complicated to even trying to explain it to you, right? They're going to go into limbo. Why did this happen? Because they needed to complete this mission. This is a one-shot deal. All this stuff's going on while there's, you know, well, gunfire's going to happen to them. It can be done creatively, but it still needs to be done in a way that it, it makes it feel natural, I guess is what I should say. So this is being, since this is being done on, on the run, um, Leonardo DiCaprio had a reason for withholding this. He didn't want his compatriots to know, but now he's sort of forced into it. I sort of kind of rambled through that one, but I hope it made sense. That was really bad exposition on my part. Um, <clears throat> Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. This is uh, exposition that's delivered in the Bakewind sequence. And if you've seen that movie for the first time, you probably didn't hear a word Indiana Jones was saying, because all we saw were snakes and bugs and monkey brains. 
Um, so I'm not sure that exposition quite worked in that sense. Don't make your exposition too clever because you do want the audience to keep up with you. Um, any James Bond movie, you know, M's going to tell him his mission, Q's going to give him the gadgets. It's just that simple. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Can you do exposition without dialogue? Absolutely. Um, who saw Jack Reacher? The first one. First, watch movies, guys. Seriously. The first eight movies, the first eight minutes of Jack Reacher, there's not a word said. And there's a ton that goes on. Um, we, you know, I can't, I could explain it to you, but it's a visual. Um, so there we go. Jack Reacher, who saw There Will Be Blood. Oh my God, give me some hands. Killing me. First 14 minutes of that movie is a wordless prologue that tells an entire story. Daniel Plainview is digging in a, in a silver mine. He discovers silver. He hurts his leg or breaks his leg. Um, what? It's the prologue. I'm not telling you anything that happens in the rest of the movie. This is literally just the first 14 minutes of a nearly three hour film. An entire story is told with no words. Who's seen the bear? This is about bears. The main characters are bears. They're not talking bears. This is not the country bears. We need to see these bears doing things. We need to see the little cub chasing after the big bear, the big bear rejecting the cub. That's that doubt rejection part, that you know, rejection to the call, the call to adventure. And then the cub, you know, he finally relents, brings the cub in, teaches the cub a thing or two about life. He teaches him how to bear. All of this without dialogue. Uh, and finally, the great train robbery, 10 minute movie. If you haven't seen this, please watch it. This is where all of your Western tropes are gonna come from. There's not a single title card in this movie, not one. It's all done visually. You can tell your story without words. Uh, now, that being said, words are useful, especially when it comes to subtext. This is where paradoxes come in. Two things can be true. People can be saying one thing and being another. I can be telling you, hey, this is how you write a screenplay, and inside I'm going, holy shit, I don't have a clue how to write a screenplay. Um, it's literally beneath the text. Literally. So it's hidden text. It's what the characters say versus what they mean. Um, the art of saying it without saying it. I love the way Robert McKee states it. Um, this is the scene is not about what the scene is about. Uh, do I have any exam examples? Yeah, here, I love this. This is a little bit of slut shaming, but it's still a good one. Who saw Iron Man? I'll do anything and everything Mr. Stark requires, including occasionally taking out the trash. He just gave a slut shame burn to poor Christine Everhart, but it's a pretty good one. How about this one? The shark is bigger than we thought. What's another way of saying that? We're going to need a bigger, we're going to need a bigger boat. Put some subtext into that. We know what he means. Uh, I saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, as you wish. Who knows what this means? I love you. Now he's now. It's stated explicitly at the beginning for a reason, so that it can be called back when. The very end of the movie. What's the last line of The Princess Bride? The very last line. As you wish. This is what this entire movie has been leading to. Grandpa loves grandson. And he's telling him via the story. Here's another one. I love this one. It's my favorite one. Who knows what this really means? Who's seen Babe, first of all? Who knows what this line means? What else? Yes. I'm not going to kill you now. Good job, pig. You get to live. That's, that's kind of a bittersweet sort of line. It's very sweet. He delivers it very sweetly. But when you think about the subtext of that line, was going to have you for bacon, but you're a good old piggy. Not going to happen. All right. Um, monologues. I'm guilty of these. I'm terrible. That's Christine. She'll tell you. Why, David? Why are there so many monologues in your stupid scripts? I know. I'm sorry. A long speech by one actor in a play or movie, part of a theatrical broadcast presentation or more than likely a long, tedious speech by one person during a conversation. Um, properly done, they can reveal character very well. Um, Quint's story on the, about the in Indianapolis in Jaws tells you a lot about his character, doesn't it? Would the movie be the same without that, uh, without that monologue? No, it would be, it's richer for that monologue, but it's there for a reason. It's not expositional, it's character. Yes, sir. Documentary is a completely different beast than screenwriting. Um, documentaries aren't technically written. You don't have a screenplay for them. Um, I've never worked on a documentary. 
they evolve as they're being made, depending on who you're talking to and what you're discovering. Uh, so that's a completely different beast. Um, Blake, who's seen Glengarry Glen Ross? You know, very famous for Glengarry Glen Ross. Very famous for Alec Baldwin's speech to the t sales team, his inspirational speech, where he basically says, you guys suck, stop sucking, and you're fired. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you, when you're doing a courtroom drama, it's kind of accepted that you're going to be doing the closing speech sometime to rouse the jury. So, yeah. Um, let's see. All right. So I wrapped up a lot earlier than I thought I was going to, so I'm going to talk about this. I had a feeling I might. Inner character conflict or the inter character conflict web. The level of conflict between each character in a story. It's not Thelma and Louise against the cops. It's Thelma and Louise for and against their boyfriends, their husbands, the police, shitty men in general, each other. What's that? Each other. Each other, exactly. Um, I'm going to go back to Black Panther for a minute. So Black Panther, ostensibly, is about the good guys. I won't blame you if you don't recognize the names. T'Challa, Nakia, Shuri, okay, Okoye, Agent Ross, Suri, Chichaka, Mbaku, sort of on the fence. But these are the good guys, essentially, who are, ver who are fighting the bad guys. Killmonger, Klau, Wakabi, Jobu. Pretty straightforward, right? Here's your conflict. Is that how it looks? Is that how conflict works? No. There's your conflict. If you watch this movie very carefully, all of these characters are at one time or another in conflict with each other. It could be very brief. It could be, um, I think it's a, I think it's, no, I think it's Nakia. It could be Nakia just, you know, throwing some shade to Agent Ross in a very brief scene. Or it could be the major conflict of Killmonger versus um, Black Panther. But all that kind of conflict just enriches your story. Um, let's see, how early did I end? I ended very early. Yep. Oh, yeah, well, as long as I ended early. Jaws in space, alien, die hard on a blank, blank, blank. Die Hard created an entire new genre of action movie that to this day is referred to as Die Hard on a Blank. Who saw Skyscraper? Do you want to know what that movie was referred to as? Die Hard in a Building. It's the <laughs> funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. I just think that's, that, that's brilliant. Um, give, a, give a what if. What if a shark came up and wouldn't stop eating the swimmers? That would be kind of a problem for your sheriff. Blank meets blank. Who's, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit? Good movie, right? They literally kind of pitched it as Looney Tunes meets Chinatown. And if you watch that movie, it's Chinatown. Forget it, Jake, it's Toontown. Um, <laughs> another brilliant film. If you haven't seen Bambi vs. Godzilla, for the love of God, do yourself a favor and watch it. Um, female Butch Cassidy. That's basically what Thelma and Louise is. Thelma and Louise is a Western set in a contemporary time. Westerns don't have to be set in a Western time. Escape from New York is set in the future. It's a Western. Outland, also set in the future, based on a Western, literally a remake of High Noon. Firefly, who's seen the TV show Firefly? It's a Western. It's a Western in space. Star Wars, you know, Han Solo is a gunslinger in space. Um, okay. Who has a film in mind for themselves? You do? All right. Who wants to pitch a logline for their film using their character, their goal, an obstacle. I put the ironic twist in there because that's like the selling point. The ironic twist is like Sheriff Brody, afraid of water, lives on an island, has to hunt a shark. It's kind of a problem. Um, yeah? You're asking for your log lines? If you would like to share it. Okay. In a post-apocalyptic world, a young woman with a mysterious connection to the land steps forward to confront an evil militaristic dictator. Okay. Make it more specific. It's good. I like it. We've got the world. Um, post-apocalyptic, I think we can nix that for something more specific. What's the post-apocalyptic world? And you might not want to... Post-apocalyptic, post yeah. That works. Um, but yeah, be more specific in some of those details. What kind of post-apocalyptic world? Water world is a post-apocalyptic world, but what kind of post-apocalyptic world? It's a world full of water because the apocalypse melted everything and flooded the world. So be specific in your post-apocalypse. What was the rest of it?
Okay, I would either drop the mysterious connection to the land or be more specific. Um, and militaristic dictator. Uh, okay, so what's her goal? Sorry, what's her goal there? Okay, so your logline can say in a post-apocalyptic world, a woman has to save her land from a, mili mili a militant dictator who wants to do what? What does he want to do? Uh, he wants to start off the new crime bomb and poisonous. Why? But why does he want to do that? I mean, uh, and if he I'm... wants to get rid of some of his competition. Okay, so that is the specificity that you want to have in your logline. Okay. You want to, You don't want to hold. You don't want to keep secrets back in your logline, especially if you're talking. Especially if this is going to be your elevator pitch and you're going to pitch this to somebody. You want to tell them what's going on. This is, they're not going to steal your story. Because first of all, you can't copyright an idea. You're not going to tell them your entire 120 page script when you're talking to them. You're going to give them the basics. And especially if you're doing a, a pitch with an actual producer, give them specifics. Because post-apocalyptic, uh, everything else is general. Uh, that, could, that could apply to any number of stories. The more specific you are, what sets your story apart, and you have some things in there, put those specifics in your story. Um, anybody else? Okay, what's a good one? What's his ultimate goal? To not get in trouble for anyone else without being checked. To not get in trouble. So he, his goal is essentially evasion. All right, so we know he's not going to succeed, right? Is that a comedy? No. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It depends on the tone. It, to it depends on the tone you set. You know, anybody who saw Pulp Fiction and saw Marvin get shot in the face knows that there's nothing. Okay, there's some things, but there's not a whole lot of gruesomeness that's off limits for comedy. Watching Marvin get shot in the face is horrifying, but it's so ridiculous that you can't help but laugh because it comes out of the situation. We're not laughing that Marvin got shot. We're laughing that idiot hitman um, Vincent Vega was holding his gun in such a way that running through a pothole caused the trigger to fire and shoot Marvin. <laughs> he didn't have anything against Marvin. It was just an accident. Now they've got to deal with this ridiculous accident. All right. Um, how much time do I have? Time drop? Okay, perfect. Um, any, should I do a Q&A? Yeah. All right, Q&A. Let's, let's All right, who has questions? I, I actually do have more material. I could talk a lot longer. <laughs> yes. Let's wait for the mic. I know. See, uncomfortable silence is the tension is killing you. Check two, check two, okay. Yeah, most writers don't like the spotlight. Here you go. <laughs> Hi. Um, so do you think um, people ever stray away from their story because they're thinking too much about what their audience will think of their story? Sure. Actually, Spielberg is famous for this. Spielberg, first of all, Spielberg is a brilliant storyteller. I think he's wonderful. But Spielberg is famously afraid of alienating his audiences. He's, he's less so now than he used to be. You know, he's taken some risks with things like Munich, um, but early in his career, he was terrified of that. He, wanted, he really wanted the audience to like him, which is why he typically made these um, you know, happy ending kind of movies. Very few Spielberg movies end on a down note. And again, it's only, it's only recently that he's done this. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to negatively impact your story, but if, it's not, if, it's, if you're okay with it no longer being the story you want to tell, that's one thing. And again, if you get new ideas and you think, oh wait, I was on this one story, but this is really interesting, for sure, follow that, follow that instinct. You can make adjustments as you go. Again, these shouldn't be rigid, they shouldn't be set in stone. The thing to keep in mind is, tell your story in a way that an audience can relate to. And we as audiences, whether, even if you're reading a book, you want a beginning, middle, and end. You want to see it come to some sort of resolution. Yes? Uh, what are your tips for rewriting and making sure you don't stay too you, you're not too close to your own material to have a successful rewrite. Uh, okay, so first of all, if you're rewriting, um, the best thing to do, at least on a first draft, is just to just vomit it out, just disgorge everything. Um, for me, when I'm writing a first draft of a screenplay, I might not even, I might not do it in order, you don't have to. I might know how it starts and I might know how it ends and I'll write that. I might not have any idea um, what happens in the middle, which is funny because that's the story. Uh, how many of you said, you know, I've, I've got this great idea for a story of uh, this coal miner is digging in a mine and it collapses. That's not a story. 
that's the start of a story. That's the catalyst to something. Um, like me, I just strayed off of your question. Uh, a lot of people will maybe tape their log line to their computer or just refer to it every once in a while. If you st but again, if you're starting to stray, or for rewriting, I guess, focus on cleaning it up. The second rewrite, just kind of clean it up. You know, you're going to have some crappy dialogue. Don't worry about that. First of all, don't judge yourself for your first draft. Never judge yourself for your first draft. That's torture. Um, and second of all, just start thinking about whether or not what you've written is the story you want to tell, or is the way you want to present the character, or is the way you want the characters to interact. You know, that's the best thing I can say about rewriting. The best thing I can say about rewriting is, is just do the rewrite. Okay. Rewriting should be about paring down. When you're writing a, a script that might have a lot of dialogue, like say you've got a scene that's really dialogue heavy, think about taking all the dialogue out and telling the exact same story in that scene, the story of that scene, with zero dialogue. Put action beats in it. And then put the dialogue back in, because then the dialogue will be more rich because it won't be specifically commenting on what's going on in the scene. It'll be commenting on how the characters react to one another. Did that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Mike's coming. When you're debating between, or when you're going to have a sad ending in a film, how do you make sure that's fulfilling to the audience if it's going to be a sad ending? That's tough. Um, I'll say this. I, I don't think your goal should be to have a sad ending. Again, I'm going to say your goal should be to tell your story truthfully. If the truth of your story is that it ends sadly, then the audience will engage with that. If the truth of your story is that these are believable characters that you can empathize with because you've been these characters and you've, been, um, you've experienced something similar to what they're going through, including all of the horrible things that they've done. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Give your characters a flaw. You know, Indiana Jones left Marion Ravenwood when she was a little kid and then came back and she slaps him in the face. Give your, you know, he's not a good, Indiana Jones is not a good guy. James Bond is famously an asshole. But we watch him because we want to be that adventurous person. Now going back to the sad story, again, I want to be the person in your story. I want to be the person commiserating with whoever's going through loss or pain or, or whatever it is. Just concentrate on that. Just concentrate on the truth of your story if the audience engages, they'll engage. If they don't, they don't. And if they don't engage the way you want them to, I'm going to go back to the beginning. You know, the audience is right. <laughs> I know that's a weird way to answer it. But. It's been said that uh, the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. Where do you recommend starting your biting the elephant? For um, example, do you sort of have the conclusion in your mind and then backfill it? Or? It just depends. For mine, I knew specific, specific spots that I knew I wanted to have um, in some of my screenplays. I can often just blow through a first act, because the first act is easy. You got characters, you know you're going to introduce the characters, you know where they live, you know what they want. That's the easy part. The hard part is giving them something to do or throwing things at them that they have to overcome. That's the hard part. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't stress. If you know how your story is going to end, write the end. Write the end first and work backwards. That's basically what memento is, starting at the end and working backwards. Um, and even if you fill those spots in, the spots that you put in first, you don't have to be married to them. You know, if you start writing your story and you've got like a, a, a part in the middle of the second act that no longer fits with what you're writing, throw it out. Write what comes next. Does that answer your question? All right. Anything else? One last question. Okay. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Um, when you're writing characters that change, yes. for example, somebody comes in and he starts out as one person, but he's really someone else, how do you write that name in the character? Do you change it accordingly? Write the in name? Other words, in other words, if he's, he comes in and, um, and the uh, main character believes his, he is Steve, she learns later he's Frank. Um, oh, so I see. So do you do the Steve Frank? In other words, he's an undercover spy or undercover cop, and she discovers that he's somebody else. Okay. How do you start out with that? Does he remain Steve, or do you then Steve slash Frank? Oh, you're talking about how do you write it on the page? Yes, how you write oh, it on the page. Oh, I see what I'm you're sorry. saying. No, no, that's okay. Yeah. Now, that's actually a really good question. Um, once it's been introduced to the reader, you can just change the name. Okay. Yeah, it's that simple. Um, make it evident in the story, like for, you know, mm -hmm. you could put a line in there. 
from this point on, Steve is now James. Okay. You know, it's not descriptive, it's not very narrative, but it is pragmatic. And the reader will appreciate that. They'll be like, okay, I know who I'm, I know who I'm reading now. Okay. Yeah. Is that it? All right. All right, thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Awesome. Great engagement, great presentation, fun examples. And now to our world famous Crapple, plus some really good stuff too. Yeah. You got that? Okay. So, raffle tickets out.